very much Astrid and thank you Open Belgium for making this happen. Dig digital technologies is here, but also cultural heritage and uh, data, which is uh, the topic of our talk today. Open cultural data in, uh, in citizen science. Lovely. This is an, an initiative of an Erasmus Plus uh, project called Citizen, si Citizen Heritage. It is about citizen science practices in cultural heritage uh, with the perspective of being sustainable in higher education. This is a consortium of European partners. We started last September and we are um, uh, a very uh, enthusiastic Thick uh, group of uh, partners, and also we we are very open to to, uh, to to other stakeholders. That's why we organize also this event today. Our project is is a compilation or a match of four dimensions that we think that in the past haven't been treated as a in a homogeneous uh, way, in a joint uh, way. These are citizen science, openness, higher education, and cultural heritage. But all together, of course, every item has been important per se, but now we try to see them as, as a nexus. Um, just one slide about the project. It, it uh, targets several results. Uh, two of them will be showcased today. The first result is a review of practices at universities in the way that universities engage in citizen-enhanced open science in the area of cultural heritage. And the second result, it is a methodology uh, about user requirements and guidelines on how cultural heritage institutions and universities can work together towards citizen science and, um, and open data. So these are um, two of the results that will be showcased in our project and will be also treated in our uh, presentation today. The first uh, result will be dealt with uh, by, by Mariana and the second by, by Fred Trujen, who is also the coordinator of the project. Uh, because we are open, and uh, we, we, we want to learn and listen to others. We have uh, invited uh, Susanna from Finland to talk about another dimension of tackling this four-dimensional scheme. So Susanna is, is with us and also we have a moderator, she will come just a bit later, uh, who is uh, Susanna Hazan from Israel. Before I leave you, uh, I give the floor to, to Mariana for the first uh, talk of this uh, workshop. Let me give a, a definition and a great definition of how we see citizen science in this uh, project. Of course, you know that public participation in science is something that um, has been uh, here for, 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 um, for, for decades, uh, even for centuries. So it is very common that citizens engage in science in many, many forms. This has started in the 19th century, actually. But what, what we want to emphasize here is how this engagement and enthusiasm and collaboration between citizens and, and researchers can lead and, and can enhance the open science objective, how open data can be reused and to strengthen uh, scientific um, endeavors. I would like also to share um, my, my, my preferred slide. It comes from, uh, from uh, an Horizon project, uh, DITOS, where it, it, it very nicely uh, shows the, the combination between open science and citizen science. So we see citizen science as a component of open, open science in a way that citizens not only uh, work hand in hand with uh, researchers, but also other teams of researchers or other teams of citizens elsewhere benefit from this interaction and this collaboration. So thank you for listening. I 
I hand over to Mariana. Mariana, are you ready? Thank you, Katarina. Uh, yes, and um, thank you for hosting this uh, roundtable, everyone, uh, at Open Belgium and Astrid. So um, I'm happy to pick it together uh, in this roundtable with uh, Susanna and uh, Fred and Susan, who will shortly arrive. So um, let's see how I can share my screen now and do the presentation. So Excellent, Mariana. I'm sorry. Okay, apparently um, we could see your screen for a, for a moment there. Yes. Okay. However, this is the PowerPoint presentation. Can you still see it? No. I don't see your screen anymore. It was open before, but I, I, it said it ended. So I think you have to uh, open it again. Okay. So yes. let's open it again. And try it this way, maybe. Yeah, it's working. Great. So um, I will be briefly discussing uh, citizen science in the cultural heritage field as part of the study conducted within the Citizen Heritage Project by highlighting a collection of practices uh, with uh, Belgian uh, partnerships. In particular, within the project study, uh, the term uh, that is being used is citizen enhanced open science, which basically stands for citizen science seen uh, from an openness lens. So citizen science as a term again is scholarly research done with public participation. We have been analyzing the openness uh, dimension and provide an indicator, an indicative nine factor stack against which we are reviewing a selection of citizen science cases. So what is the scope of the citizen heritage study? It is to connect the fields of citizen science, cultural heritage and higher education, examining research questions as how universities can act as citizen science incubators, how to connect civic engagement uh, with open science and how to move towards active public engagement models in scholarly research. The study collected citizen science use cases through a desktop research that um, uh, was conducted by the project partners and a public survey during January and February of 2021. Approximately 110 cases have been selected against a set of four criteria. Uh, we filtered down this pool to 25 practices, good practices that managed to meet most of the four criteria. These were then tested against of uh, a six systems typology and today's presentation contains a selection of all of these practices that involve uh, Belgian partners. So today we focus on the open scope, which is one of the typology items of the study. This maps openness into nine categories, which uh, we were formed, uh, which were formed by examining the outcomes and uh, the research design of the citizen science cases, together with uh, good practices uh, in open science. Uh, this includes generally open access, uh, open data, and open metadata and of course this separation is meaningful in sharing data within citizen science projects and uh, in the cultural heritage sector we will discuss about this uh, separation shortly and um, there is an indicative selection of eight cases related to cultural heritage and citizen science in belgium 
or within Belgian partnerships that are part of the citizen heritage study. So some of these projects use the term citizen science, whereas others use a more descriptive uh, sense of uh, these terms or may use uh, other kind of uh, similar uh, terms as crowdsourcing or public research participation. Uh, so the REITS project initiative one is one of the early examples following a collaborative approach and uh, creating participatory experiments. Europeana migration is a series of uh, migration story sharing with the public. And um, initiative three is Kaleidoscope, which is about a historical um, review of the 50s in Europe and connects uh, to the Europeana collections. The Europeana is uh, the, the um, uh, will be presented shortly, actually, uh, the Europeana projects uh, by Dr. Chu Yen in the next presentation, who was part in the development uh, of these uh, projects uh, together with the Photo Consortium Association. Pagode explores Chinese cultural heritage within Europe by applying uh, novel participatory practices and a Europeana XXR civil science or crowdsourcing campaigns for enriching Europeana, which is the aggregator of European cultural heritage content or meta aggregator. And the crowd heritage is a platform for doing crowdsourcing campaigns in order to enrich in order to enrich metadata of cultural content that can then be connected to uh, Europeana. And finally, uh, there is a Spoteron, which is a platform and uh, a, a software framework for developing citizen science applications. It is not open source as far as I know. However, it allows for open participation and uh, one of the projects is art spots that lets people document street art. And finally, the project uh, uh, witnesses, uh, it's better not pronounce the, the Belgian word, uh, which is, um, it, it has initiated and extended public transcription of uh, historical resources about uh, depositions within Belgian courts in the 18th and 19th century. So the methodology follows the three models, a classification type of civic engagement that is presented by Bonnie et al. It's a widely cited categorization within citizen science. So contributory concerns to um, less interactions, whereas co-creative uh, is on the other side with more interaction uh, to it, to citizen uh, science projects. And uh, as we see, uh, most of the um, uh, projects are contributory in their civic engagement type and few are collaborative co-creative. This applies also to the rest of the 120 cases. Um, so we view the open scope for each of the factors that cover a field on open data as a summary for all eight categories. In this case, open access for all eight citizen science projects concerning Belgium or Belgian partnerships, they seem uh, generally good. A provision should be made for when a certain project is completed and is being archived. We've seen projects uh, kept, open, kept, kept open after completion and others that are not accessible anymore online. The open data is uh, fairly, um, is partly good and the open metadata is fairly good um, as opposed to open data that may be sometimes not shared with open licenses. Um, however, this is an interesting finding since many projects presented here are connected to Europeana which applies the data ex exchange agreement, which means that all metadata uh, entering Europeana must be released under CC0. So uh, this enables uh, open metadata to be created at large. 
In general, the 25 selected uh, citizen science cases within the citizen uh, heritage study are doing fairly good or partly good to meet certain open standards. Uh, however, within these eight uh, selected projects and generally, um, uh, there is a more, um, th th there is a lack, uh, let's say, on open data, um, open data, more data driven and uh, more data driven approach um, regarding metrics, documentation, and a convenient way to download data uh, should be also taken into account. It's also poorly covered uh, through a data dump or a repository, uh, as a repository, probably, and an API. So here goes a more detailed case-by-case -case view of the open scope that has been evaluated through a set of uh, similar open standards and open policies. Most practices are doing fairly good in applying and communicated their, uh, communicating their open access policy and data ownership. Uh, however, it seems uh, challenging to apply the FAIR data principles, which stand for findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable data, in this case, cultural data, since, um, for example, the interoperability especially needs uh, support on an infrastructure level as well. So uh, there is also the, um, the presentation of data-driven metrics that is uh, mostly missing and would be also useful to integrate. And finally, uh, concluding, there are three suggestive uh, fields where open data governance and open science is actively being developed within citizen science. And this can be relevant uh, within an interdisciplinary context, also relevant for the cultural heritage sector. It maps the challenges in the field regarding standards, ethics, and quality. Uh, for example, for citizen science, there is a certain uh, protocol and data model that is being used, PPCR core. Probably this can be also um, employed uh, for uh, cultural heritage citizen science projects or maybe uh, formalized, especially uh, for um, this kind of projects. There are um, also people-oriented uh, data principles, as for example, the care principles. This can also be discussed in the context of citizen science, pro probably. The care prin principles stands for um, a collective benefit for authority to control, responsibility and ethics. It is uh, primarily designed for indigenous people, but it can also be about uh, local communities, about contemporary communities that follow traditional knowledge. For so this can be also um, principles that can be uh, see, view within the citizen science projects, especially the ones that deal with indigenous populations. And uh, quality assurance, where this is a um, field, how to make data within citizen science being uh, uh, trustable. So the next steps are to the release the full study of the Citizen Heritage Project uh, within uh, July 2021. I thought it was full, actually. Uh, uh, um, it will be open access. And then uh, to do a further research on FAIR principles, which is now out of the scope of the Citizen Heritage Study. Uh, however, it seems that it can be an interesting way to go. So thank you from our side. and. Um, I would like to welcome uh, maybe uh, Susanna uh, or maybe Dr. Truyen. Okay, there he, here you are, everyone. So yeah, hello, hello. Uh, I'll, I'll open my uh, camera also. Uh, so hello, uh, good evening. <laughs> um, Will I do a presentation now, or is it Susanna's that? Uh... Yes, please, Fred. Uh, you can go ah, ahead. Okay. Yes. I, so I will share my screen if possible. Um, um, okay. I hope it 
works. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll yes, present. Here. Yeah. Uh, I will. Uh, I will now uh, maximize my screen, but I will come back to my uh, non-presentation mode. Uh, because I need I need to show some websites also, and then uh, uh, so I'll I'll uh, quickly go uh, to to that now. Uh, what I we wanted to present so uh, Sophie and I, but Sophie unfortunately had uh, an issue in the beginning of the week and couldn't join us today. Um, but all is well. Now um, we wanted to show some examples in the first place on what is actually going on and what the steps could be to uh, move towards citizen science. Um, uh, because there is already a lot going on in the heritage sector of including citizens and engaging uh, users and, and, and citizens to uh, review collections, to annotate collections, to crowdsource uh, objects, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, many of these activities fall a bit short of being really citizen science. And so what we aim to do in the project uh, uh, Citizen Heritage is to come up with um, a kind of um, handy guidelines that would help you to make this extra step and, uh, and, and certainly to advocate that it doesn't require that much. Of course, science always involves a lot of effort, but uh, a lot of effort is already going on in, the, in engaging the audiences. And we only have to be smart about how we do this. And so uh, what, what we will publish here are two things. First of all, uh, guidelines that translate the work that Katharina and, uh, just, uh, and, and Tim just uh, 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 presented and, um, and translates it into um, handy uh, guidelines that you can use when you prepare an action a research-based uh, action. And um, we will um, uh, focus on four steps. Uh, the preparation, because we think a lot of the difference between uh, generic crowdsourcing activities or user participation activities in CHIs uh, need extra steps in the preparation phase to uh, become eligible to really uh, generate citizen science. And then we will have a look at, at what should be done during the research. And then, of course, uh, the goal, because science is still about uh, communicating with the right scientific uh, uh, audience uh, through uh, publications, through academic publications. And, uh, uh, to communications in, in conferences, etc. So uh, there, there need to be uh, a careful consideration on how the citizen engagement translates into what is published in the publications. And then a step that is mostly forgotten, then that is in fact in many cases, even in the best uh, practice examples, is completely forgotten is how do you close the circle with the citizens that actually participate? How will they uh, know how the scientific discourse is continuing? And it is for that kind of things that we uh, want to set up these guidelines. Now, for in the preparation of the research action, uh, I think it is uh, of utmost important that you have a reflection on the role of participants because what we see in, in crowdsourcing and, and user engagement in heritage, uh, uh, in the heritage sector, and we did uh, a large study now with, within Europeana 
also in the Europeana Common Culture Project, where uh, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Rob Davies uh, made a, a, a substantial report on the use of crowdsourcing in the, the Europeana uh, environment. And we see that uh, there are different uh, roles in which citizens are involved. Sometimes they are really the object of study. So you seek participation to study the people in question. And um, that could be uh, in the context of intangible heritage, of uh, oral history, etc. And of course, this, uh, this entails another relationship with these participants. It would be a little bit wrong to, uh, to uh, mistake uh, participants that you observe with kind of objects in your lab. So there are, there are some, some ethical and, 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 uh, and, uh, aspects and aspects also of respect to, to uh, participants that are actually uh, a part of, of being observed. And so that is a, a totally different role than when you uh, use the crowd to lower a bit your workload, which is often what is done. And for example, uh, we ask for annotations and we ask for citizen contributions in these annotations. Then people spend a bit of their time to help you out. Hmm? Well, again, this is another role. Hmm? And, uh, and so we will describe um, uh, a number of uh, persona, hmm? uh, typical roles of participation. And for each of these roles, we will see what the consequences are for a correct scientific uh, approach. Um, and then, of course, but I think you are all aware of this, for, for any research that involves participation, you need to demonstrate, uh, just as when you do quantitative research and you do a survey among people, you need to demonstrate that your sample is representative. And we see that in crowdsourcing actions, this is often overlooked and that people are just happy with the contributions and are not really monitoring um, if um, the contributions come from a, a representatively diverse audience. Uh, and, uh, and this leads to a bias. And, and specifically, I'll come back to that in, in, the, in the projects that we did ourselves, uh, how this can be an issue. Um, and then, of course, what, uh, uh, what uh, Katarina and, and Mariana have, have, have uh, uh, gathered is uh, how are participants informed and so uh, in our guidelines we will indeed try to indicate what kind of information should participants find on your website about your scientific project and uh, it is our conviction that this needs standardization and uh, we hope in the in the process of the citizen heritage project to come up with standardization proposals so that when you do a project that involves citizens and, and citizen participation, there is a, a kind of standard way to inform them about what their role is, what they can expect, what will be done with their inputs, uh, in what way uh, they are part of the obs observed or part of the observance. Hmm? Uh, these are all things that need some more clarification. But in fact, when you when you have a, a guideline, you can you can easily, as a researcher, uh, 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 check the boxes, and and we think that we need more of these templates to do so. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, we realize that there is a, a tension between. Uh, user participation and managing privacy, and on the other hand, uh, 
protecting author rights because depending on the role eh, that the the citizen participant takes they can move along from contributors to really co-authors and co-creators and in the letter they need to be mentioned in a very different way and uh, one of the scientific discussions that many of you already must be aware of is that there are growing discussions about how students have contributed to research papers and are not mentioned as co-authors and, and I think everybody who today works at the university knows of, of that kind of cases where there is some uh, some discussion about hey are are the contributions of master's thesis research uh, properly addressed in in the publications and you can easily imagine that the same holds for um, for uh, uh, let's say a kind of very proactive um, uh, uh, group of citizen participants that also were engaged in research. And the same holds for um, citizen representative organizations and that are often key players when you, um, when you engage in citizen science, that you work together with community representative organizations, with patient organizations, with, with cultural lovers organizations etc uh, like here in, in the cultural heritage sector and that needs also to be better managed uh, and so the same kind of questions will come back uh, while running your research action and a research action in cultural heritage can be a workshop in which citizens uh, participate it can be a, a kind of annotations campaign it can be a translation a campaign or, or, or a transcribe-a-ton or uh, there are so many uh, many good examples of of, uh, of uh, uh, very efficient ways to get uh, citizen contributions uh, but then again uh, what we will be looking at in this project is uh, how can you make sure that during these activities you are uh, uh, conform uh, uh, research standards uh, so that you uh, for example make sure that the the contributions are identifiable and traceable uh, that is that is certainly one of the requirements uh, that uh, that the uh, research setup can be copied and can be uh, 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 tested whether whether in other circumstances we get similar results etc um, but these are all measures that you can you can uh, take uh, but much more important i think is that we um, um, that you should be prepared to manage discord conflict and divergent opinion when you engage citizens in uh, citizen research um, and often this is um, often a bit overlooked, even in the largest uh, citizen science efforts that, that were held in my region, this idea that uh, maybe the, the participants have very conflicting views and, uh, and divergent opinions on, on how to run this and how to do that uh, are, are a bit overlooked. And, and, uh, and so some, um, some best practices on managing this uh, and, and also uh, using good software tools to, to, online, uh, to manage these kind of things online or during a, a workshop are uh, certainly uh, uh, important. Uh, and then, of course, there is uh, uh, the whole phase after the, the research. Uh, where um, uh, I think it is important to close the circle and to, to make sure that you anticipate on, on the website of your project in what way the participants will be kept current on the evolutions, on how this research will be uh, 
presented where, uh, in what kind of uh, uh, journals, in what kind of conferences, uh, and how they, when they are interested, can can uh, keep themselves also informed. These are in fact quite easy to do steps. And again, we, we think that a bit of standardization could help uh, there. Now, the gist of my presentation is to show you a few examples and to reflect on those. I count on uh, Mariana or Katerina to cut me short when it becomes too long because I I cannot uh, 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 watch the time in the same time, uh, but feel free to just interrupt me because I think you will get the um, uh, the gist of, of what I uh, I want to to say uh, already in in the first few examples. So I will uh, now uh, swap. <laughs> yes? Two minutes. Okay. Yes, yes, but please, it's, it's super interesting. We are a bit late, but please do two minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, some examples. One was the Europeana Migration Collection Days. And there, what Europeana, in fact, does is have a, a good introduction on how it works. And so we participated in many of these collection days where people told their stories. And uh, it was amazing because people brought an object that we then digitized and that, that was... Uh, uh, harvested by uh, uh, heritage uh, institutions yeah? and the stories are published on Europeana so you can find them here in these migration stories. Now uh, reflecting on this it was very intensive very uh, confronting also to to hear these stories. Uh, uh, one of the things we didn't do yet is really publish historical research based on these stories because since it was an Europeana effort it goes in too many directions so now we think that we will do more focused collections days uh, in the context of specific projects so that we know that we can really publish a part of, of, uh, of uh, user testimonial history on the basis of that. That is something that we couldn't do on the basis of these collections since they are too, dis too, uh, too diverse. Uh, the thing that we also uh, lack here is good information on this page eh, on what are your pri what is your privacy status on what uh, basis will we publish it we did this with the participants that came to the events and so one of the reflections could already be maybe a bit more information up front can improve uh, uh, these experiences uh, but again this is really generating a lot of uh, invaluable material that uh, that can be the basis of historical research eh? and so it's a very important work of CHIs it's also a very uh, a good uh, format to do with students eh? so students collaborate in these collections days and so there is a good link between heritage institutions and education another project went further and maybe that's the last that I can show in the few minutes I have. Um, uh, it's a project, uh, We Are Europe for Culture, that we did for the for EASEA, yeah, for the DJ, DJ Culture. And uh, we, we hosted events in 10 cities where we co-created exhibitions. So instead of just asking annotations to people and contributing to our collections and the, and the selections that we made, we wanted the citizens to curate an exhibition together with expert curators. And so my colleague Sophie, who is a digital curator, guided these workshops. And, and so the citizens became co-authors and co-creators of these uh, collections. And that poses a lot of difficult questions. One of the, the things we did was in uh, Finland, where we had... Uh, 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 prison guards and former inmates telling stories together. 
about life in this in this prison, which is now a museum. And our colleagues in Finland made publications about that in, in uh, oral history uh, journals. Mm -hmm. uh, so there we really had a scientific output. But of course, the privacy involved of, uh, of the people, the people you see here in the photos, uh, uh, made agreements with us that we could publish everything. Yeah? So it's a selection of, of these people. Others preferred uh, not, not to come forward, uh, etc. So that is a much more difficult format. And for that, we, we, we think we have a lot of experience to share, and we will put those in the recommendations. Um, and then uh, if I have still a, a few uh, minutes, um, we step closer to what we will be using in, uh, in uh, citizen heritage, which are the projects that we ran on the WIT platform developed by NTUA, by our colleagues of NTUA, and the Crowd Heritage platform that you see here. And Crowd Heritage is really a tool to uh, gather uh, annotations by uh, the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, uh, it, it is a very successful platform, but it stops short, of course, of being able afterwards to really uh, identify the profile of the participants. So, and if we would like to have the profile, we would come into uh, more difficult waters about privacy conditions, etc. So this is certainly something that we will be talking about within our current project and on how can we do this next step. Um, we chose also to link it with open link, link to open data thesauri so that people cannot just freely annotate but have to choose. They have to choose between a terminology that is uh, part of uh, uh, a thesaurus. And of course, on this choice element, we also need more study to see how we can um, uh, better um, describe how we selected these thesauri, what the user experience is about these thesauri, and whether the participants feel that they can really express what they want. Eh? So. On the other hand, if they just freely express it, you get fuzzy data that you cannot really use in the heritage sector. So there are some, some cross, uh, some uh, tra trade-offs that you have to make. And it is really, I think, in the trade-offs that we will see the emergence of really citizen science, eh, where really the citizen can know that they contributed knowingly and consciously to uh, to getting uh, um, uh, information uh, validated and and so we need to uh, to try to erase all the the friction elements the vague uh, uh, practices that that still exist and uh, and ICT tools like Crowd Heritage are ideal to to make this kind of thing because you, you can add and you can develop the software, you can add functionalities. And for example, now we will certainly be discussing what we should add uh, uh, in that context. Uh, Fred. That is in fact what I wanted to present. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, and uh, I think we are very lucky to have people who have lots of experience in cultural heritage along the decades to see actually the progress of how citizen engagement evolves. Uh, through 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 the through, through time, uh, many many thanks, uh, dear Fred. Uh, I would like to give the floor to our next uh, invited speaker, um, Susanna Anas from um, Open Knowledge Finland. And then uh, please uh, stay with us. We'll be having a Q and A moderated by Susan Hazan. Floor is yours, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you and hello from Finland. It's uh, sunny still up and then there's a little bit of snow uh, report. Everybody needs to be talking a little bit of the weather. So um, I will uh, send you a link that you can um, go and spend your time with the, the, uh, the, the archives of last Hack for Open Glam last year. If, if uh, you know, you get bored listening to me or listening to the 
presentation and also while I try to find the presentation and, and uh, put it on. So, um, <laughs> do I have it here? It doesn't seem too difficult this time. Here we go. And here we go. And let's see what's happening here. And it hasn't come yet, but it will. Yeah, yes, it's coming. Okay. So, um, I um, in Finland we have this arrangement, which uh, is quite experimental. Uh, the organization, or the I represent Avoinglam, which is a working group at the Open Knowledge Finland, uh, has traditionally been. But this year we have started a new arrangement uh, with uh, Wikimedia and Creative Commons Finland chapters to put together the Glam activities in that, uh, in that, uh, um, together in that uh, group, working group. And um, so here I am, I'm representing Avoin Glam at the same time as I'm representing all these three organizations. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, um, Hack for Open Glam, which is a cultural hackathon for Open Glam activities. And um, as we are uh, in this session uh, here, I'm more or less sure that everybody is familiar with these concepts. And I'm trying to, to bridge uh, between the, the scientific uh, view to this um, particular way of uh, dealing with cultural heritage. Um, and I think this is what my presentation is about, about bridging between these different, um, not, not these two different, but different um, uh, approaches to cultural heritage and how they would be able to benefit each other. Uh, so um, just, just put it briefly, what, what, what was Hack for Open Glam? It was a, an Open Glam hackathon at the, in the context of a Creative Commons Global Summit, and that was organized in October last year and uh, now we are setting it up for this year uh, it, that and it will be taking place in September and um, let's see I will I will tell about three different background stories of of how this came to be first of all first one is the like the timeline wise so uh, Avangram has been organizing uh, cultural hackathons in Finland since 2015, but there was a precedent in 2012 when the Open Knowledge Festival was arranged in Helsinki, and uh, th there was the first um, first glam hackathon organized already then. And here you can see in the picture Sanna Martila, who has been the the driving force behind the hackathons uh, up until last year when we we were going to uh, create the Hack for Fee 2020. We have also um, also tested our wings with a different kind of hackathon uh, for for children, and I think it was a very uh, good experiment. But maybe we don't have continuity uh, in uh, uh, education or the, like the, the creators, me personally. And therefore, it hasn't been done uh, since. But I think it's also one one important um, aspect to keep in mind um, that uh, the things that we are doing are educative, and that um, well, I'll, I'll come back to to those ideas. But anyway, so so going back to the timeline, uh, last year in March, you everybody knows uh, that the thirteenth Friday. Of March last year was really uh, the, the, the time when all of the world closed down. So this was the date when we were supposed to have our hackathon. We were meeting the night before and, and realized that okay, now it's now it's officially a pandemic. So shall we shall we arrange our uh, indoors closed doors three day event? Uh, and we decided not to. And uh, and uh, we wouldn't know at that point how what to do with it, but uh, we would uh, then eventually propose it for the for the Creative Commons Global Summit, and uh, it was uh, accepted, and that turned out to be a very very good um, uh, idea. So the other uh, background story I want want to mm, present uh, is the the whole idea of 
of glam hackathons. And I think here, here you, I may be oversimplifying, uh, but please, uh, please uh, comment uh, if you, if you, if you want to um, discuss <laughs> what I'm going to present. I'm. Um, we have been. Uh, we have mostly been um, associated, or like we have. Uh, well, I added these pictures late in the. So it's breaking my timeline. Anyway, um, our context has been the Nordic uh, context, where the all the Nordic uh, countries have arranged their own uh, cultural hackathons, and. Uh, this is uh, these are the ones that we have been most uh, in contact with uh, the coding da vinci and the glam hack in switzerland as well as the three other nordic ones and uh, and now i i kind of i shouldn't i shouldn't add a, add a, add a slides in the middle i completely lost my my story anyway well over the, about the oversimplification somehow i am um, uh, the the basic or the let's say the original the traditional uh, idea of glam hackathons is maybe based on a, recipro a reciprocal re a relation between advocates of open access to cultural heritage and the glam institutions themselves like the advocacy perspective uh, it wishes or like we promote uh, open access in order to to have those uh, cultural heritage assets uh, locked in institutions to be widely used for, to create new cultural um, activities and uh, the institutions uh, in in uh, turn wish to maybe benefit from this uh, this uh, effort of opening and 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 meet these um, creators who can prov provide uh, ideas for apps and services. So, as I said, this is probably an oversimplification, but how um, this could probably be developing that uh, instead of uh, mm, maybe have this uh, this do, do bipolar uh, set up, there may be a more multifaceted interaction between different act, uh, actors and what we should be doing as i was uh, referring to the children earlier that we should challenge the digital transformation together that um, that experiment uh, and uh, learn and play and take the uh, activity of open glam as public engagement which also means that that we would all, always be um, considering it as part of the uh, societal interactions in, uh, in, in a larger scale. Um, take into more perspectives like the user's perspective, the citizen's perspective, a global perspective of the perspectives of different, uh, maybe underrepresented uh, communities and focus on doing together network uh, among other events uh, as i as i showed the, the the glam hackathons but also actors in different uh, walks of life and then develop a, what i see as a very very important thing is develop the digital skills of the citizens of all ages and then the third background uh, story is um, i myself have worked with wikimedia a lot and uh, uh, i see that this um working with these open platforms and maybe open methods and technologies is something that we could um let's say explore together and um, there are important um uh, strong benefits in working with let's say wikimedia and but 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 uh, open platforms in general that there are global glam communities around the world that have developed rich ways of capturing and revitalizing cultural heritage not only wikimedia but also creative commons and open knowledge and um, mozilla uh, have uh, have uh, active uh, active um, 
active activities around around uh, working with the digital uh, cultural heritage. And then there's uh, the other side, the academic uh, academic digital humanities uh, um, research, open science part, which uh, could and should be linked with these um, practices of maybe um, more free form um, volunteer contributions. And then there are the, the GLAM institutions themselves, which uh, form another um, another set of uh, actors and that, that I can see that we should be um, creating more interaction between all these types of working uh, and then the citizens should be in, actively engaged in all, all of this but they may, there may be different configurations of how this happens but I think there should be um, um, uh, activities that are run from, well, that can um, mobilize the whole network of these different uh, actors also, well, from whichever side, that's what I would like to say, yes. And then that the platforms uh, are um, providing, that, that they are rather accessible, multilingual, uh, linked and trustworthy and that these should be able to be mobilized for different purposes. Right, so uh, here are, I'm going to show some, some things that we did in the last hackathon last year. Uh, the first one is coming up soon. No, this, yeah. And well, this, <laughs> I missed this uh, slide. There's um, the point of diversity. Uh, which is uh, another direction where I think this uh, collaboration should be um, taken to the diversity of languages, of geography, of different kinds of representation, of domains, and also these methods, as well as then go come together, explore, play, and learn from each other. And this is what we did last year. Uh, there were workshops. We before the Creative Commons Summit days, the, the day before there was a, an extensive 14-hour program of workshops and events, uh, spanning the whole uh, global time zones. Uh, there were over 30 presenters in these workshops, and uh, and uh, they would tackle very different things. This is the European Give It Up. Uh, workshop and this is one of the one of the India winners whose um, whose work this is and um, we also had a few panels uh, a couple of uh, two different uh, discussion events uh, and then the pitching session in this 14 hour program this one was organized by the poem uh, research group at uh, mm -hmm. the, the poem fellows at uh, the um, Hamburg University, Angeliki Tsuganatu and uh, Francisca Mucha and Koptan Tran. And the name of this one was the, what is uh, Glam Hackathon, which is the way we, we invited a different uh, Glam, uh, oh sorry, not this one. Oh, this one is accessing cultural heritage approaches from high to low. Um, and uh, the idea of this um, this specific uh, panel was to compare the different um, methods that different uh, GLAM organizations need to take or can are uh, able to take, depending on what kind of uh, resources they have at hand. Um, they, and the, the program projects during the hackathon were quite different. Uh, multifaceted, there were translation drives to Pictathon's crowdsourcing events. And uh, um, the idea is that they were not necessarily uh, all hack projects, but they were also doathons and things that uh, events where users or other participants were invited to to contribute their time and effort to, to do something. This one is from the Finnish uh, National um, uh, archives uh, project uh, the, where they were matching lists of missing soldiers to dog tags of fallen Finns in the 
Second World War. And actually, there was one uh, one uh, casualty, un one ident unidentified casualty was identified based on the work that was done over the hackathon. And also, um, also hack projects took place, things that were experiments uh, uh, or trying testing different technologies, etc. So um, the the key for next year's or this year's uh, event is to to promote knowledge equity and um, the, to promote different languages, cultures, and mindfulness about uh, representing them on global platforms. And there's um, a survey I would like everyone who's interested to fill in because this is a way to to uh, enroll in um, in preparations and uh, as well as collect uh, experiences from the last one. And um, I went over time myself. I'm sorry. I um, I will stop now and give floor to questions. Super, Susanna. Can I ask uh, Susan to moderate the, the discussion, please? L lots of food for thought, Susanna. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I just put up my slides. Um, can I ask all our speakers to show themselves on the video, please? And can I ask if you can see my um, PowerPoint or not? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, I'll just leave up the screen just for a minute because I can't see you actually, which is very annoying. Um, and I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I, I found this meeting absolutely fascinating. Uh, has somebody got their, their microphone on for a second? Yeah. Um, feedback. Uh, I found the conversation fascinating. I'm actually very very active in the Europeana um, Association Network. I'm chairing. I'm currently chairing the network and working with Fred um, on different uh, activities there. Um, and I'm I'm looking. You're talking about. I'm thinking to myself. My goodness, what have I done when I contributed um, my own objects into the Europeana um, collections on collection days? And I'm just thinking about the things you're saying. And I'm just beginning to wonder, what on earth did I do? I joined in um, as a dedicated citizen um, who wanted to contribute. I offered some objects for my personal collection. My mother, for example, in the migration days collection, I sat in and I described um, how she had migrated, what she took with her, what was important. And uh, this is actually her um, identity card that she was very proud to receive when she was first um, became an immigrant in Israel. On sports collection day or collection week, whatever it was, um, I sent an image of myself as a, as a hockey, as a captain of the hockey team. I don't know why I did that. That was the only historical photo I had in my collect, my own personal collection, and I thought it was a good idea. But listening to what you guys are saying, I'm beginning to wonder if I've offered up myself um, into this world of free data, free um, objects within Europeana, what happens at this point once I've released myself, my collections, my objects, who can do what they want with it? I mean, who is going to then take this up and uh, comment or interact with my personal collections, which I gave up freely, obviously. Um, I think actually uh, Fred made an interesting comment, who's being observed and who are the observants? I think this conversation is not a new conversation. Clifford Gertz many years ago was talking about the interpretive turn, um, the anthropological turn, and we are very clear now that we do not objectify people or objects. So this is my little contribution that I wanted to just add now. Um, do you have, do you have, Shlomo, do you have a slide for the background now or should I just take it out? You have a background slide? Um, no, no, Susan, we don't. Okay, so we'll put something else there. <laughs> <I'll stop laughs> okay, so I have yeah. actually I put it into the deck, the, uh, set uh, that slide of uh, as a background slide. It's actually in the slide deck in your 
uh, your you can use that one if you wish. Okay, that's fine. Right. So that was just my two penneth worth because uh, uh, I was very interested in, in in what happens to collections once they go online. Um, First of all, let me ask our audience if they would like to ask questions of the, the speakers. So please put them in the chat and then I will ask the speakers um, on behalf of my of, of the audience. Before I start, I, I have a question to all of you um, and perhaps you can answer whoever feels that this is important to them. Uh, how, does, how do citizen science projects benefit cultural heritage institutions? And what do the institutions gain from these kinds of efforts? Is it in their interest? And the reason I ask this is, as I'm, I've, I've been a curator, a professional curator all my life, 37 years, and curators know it all. So what can the citizen, the private citizen, bring into a collection that the curator didn't already know? So how would you deal with this idea? What do cultural heritage institutions gain from this? Who would like to answer? Shall I? Shall I yeah. start? Maybe? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that that uh, exactly the curator doesn't know it all. <laughs> that is the the problem. That uh, that uh, lived experiences and, and intangible heritage uh, are are things that. Uh, you need the original sources for, and the sources are in this case people, and and uh, that can give their testimonials and uh, uh, to to understand the correct context. And and we see indeed that uh, there are a lot of collections in cultural heritage institutions that are in need of better documentation, of better descriptions and of, of better connecting to the, the, the experiences. And certainly, given the fact that communities are changing, and, and this means that the object that was recorded, say, 50 years ago, may be lost connection to its original group of, of you know, community, and that other communities come in the place that have other experiences with these same objects and other and, and give other value to these objects. And it is not for us in the heritage sector to be judgmental about history, but to record what is happening and to and to try to, to see these connections. And that is where indeed this outreach to, to, to citizens and their contributions can work and, and and we see that that a lot of stories that didn't make the history books are now really the stories that are adamantly shared and that are told and, and that are uh, surfacing. And Susanna wants to, yes, to add to that. Yeah. yeah. Please do. I would like to maybe make a small point of um, of the citizens of the or the subjects of history being able to take over the the history writing rather than being objects of um, of uh, of the history writing so so yeah changing turning the the perspective that would be important in uh, in these um, citizen engagement public engagement projects mariana you're nodding here what would you like to add to this <laughs> yes, I totally agree with what uh, Dr. Tuyen and uh, Susanna just said. Maybe adding that it's also in terms of, um, for sure, raising um, awareness among um, among the public or at the uh, so the series process a way of dealing with the collections from one side uh, as curators and from the other side public that gains knowledge but also gives back since this is also a matter of uh, time and scalability for example a very large collection may be uh, may take a lot of time for curators to actually uh, document it and uh, do some metadata description whereas with citizens within it this can be done in a very in a very shorter time yes yeah, so what about authority that um the question of questions um katerina would you yeah. about authority yes because perhaps we should uh, slowly close also uh, this workshop 
perhaps let me just place a little bomb in this discussion, okay? Because uh, by, by, by listening to Fred, definitely with his experience and his expertise, he's a professor, he knows citizen driven and citizen engagement for decades, right? It's, it's his um, job, it's, it's a scholar job. But, but I think that mm, times have changed now. So we see citizens, by definition, taking an active role, uh, whether at least it has, is invited by scholars or not. I think we all agree that digital activism is a reality that is much more present than the last decades. I think the, the agility of citizens to go down in the, in the streets and claim things, environment, racism, me too, you name it, it's much more radical. And there are terms like guerrilla science now. Well, citizens don't even need scientists, you know, they, they do science from their own. So I think it's not only about raising awareness, it's about being prepared to also the other extremes where citizens have the abilities to do things that may not be mainstream, that are not mainstream, but perhaps have a potential in how we see science, we see society, and we uh, are not isolated in our ivory towers at, at universities, and hear how societies change, little by little. Well, that is a bombshell, absolutely. Um, and I would love to debate this with you guys. Um, because on one hand, I completely agree with you, obviously, it's terribly important. Um, but on the other hand, I worked too long in a museum to, to give up the, the, author, the authenticity and the responsibility of, <laughs> of registering um, in, and um, presenting objects. So I would love to come back at another time and debate this in further depth. But I understand we're wrapping up now because we have to keep to time. But anyway, it was great listening to you guys. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think that is uh, the ideal uh, closing uh, remark. Yeah? But we see that, that this role of custodian uh, that we have in the heritage sector is evolving and that uh, uh, organizations like ICOM, uh, like ICA, are reviewing their the mission, the core mission of, uh, and we, we need to think back, why did we start in the first place to make archives? Why did we come to museums and, and, and think about what that can mean in the digital world and in this new world where the citizens are more proactive and more, uh, uh, so, so it's a rethink of, 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 uh, of the whole uh, cycle, I would say. Uh, but there will always be kind of custodians, eh? and, and, and uh, but uh, <laughs> hopefully these are the CHI uh, people. Yeah, um, we'll defend our objects to the very end. <laughs> yeah, definitely to be continued. This conversation cannot be put at rest here. It's the beginning of the conversation, not the end of one, I think. We should organize a European um, webinar, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, it is time to close. Astrid, Astrid is our host from Open Belgium. Let us thank Open Belgium again for this wonderful opportunity and the range of other talks uh, during these three days. Thank you very much to the, to the participants. We hope to stay with, in touch with you. And thank you very much to the presenters. Thank you. Goodbye.